Welcome on this blistering North London day to the fourth in our series of online conversations about cultivating wisdom, with a particular motive of how we might act, lead and live wisely in this pandemic. We've heard from Jane Gort Roger on organisational wisdom, from Alison Hogan on dwelling the empty space, the fertile void of not knowing, and Adam Wells took us on a journey down the El Camino, a 500 mile liminal space. I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined in conversation with the wonderful Tim Heath on the wisdom and possibility of the dissenting imagination. Are you there, Tim? I am, and thank you very much for inviting me. No, it's a great pleasure, Tim. And Tim, you know this, but others might not, but among other, many other things, you're chair of the Blake Society. And I and many others have really enjoyed being in conversation with you here in North London, sometimes at 17 South Moulton Street, in one of the houses of William Blake and Catherine for 18 years, I think, in the early 19th century. And more recently in the world of Zoom. So a really big thank you for spending time with us now. And this subject seems so important around wisdom, around the wisdom and possibility of the dissenting imagination, the notion of dissent, thoughts perhaps that from outside what are seen politically and socially acceptable, such an important theme now, and imagination, leaps of the mind, free of the senses, shaping up new possibilities that seem to be both these in the air. And I'd love to really explore that with you, Tim. Thank you. So how would you like us to get into this and start to open it up for us all? I'd like to begin by going back in time, just over 20 years, huh. to the year of 1997 and the month of May. And in particular, the 2nd of May, 1997. And this was the day after the landslide election victory of Tony Blair. And I want us to just begin here because I think wisdom is seen in decision making as well as other places. And in government, there are some of the most important decisions. But if just to engage in the ritual narrative of the English constitution, <laughs> at about 11 o'clock on Friday the 2nd of May, John Major, the incumbent prime minister, gets into his limousine with his security entourage and drives to the palace, Buckingham Palace. He sweeps in through one of the gateways and into the main courtyard. And there he has an audience with the monarch, the queen, and offers his resignation. They have a chat over tea, I imagine. Yeah, I can imagine, yes. And then he leaves in a private car. A few minutes later, another entourage sweeps into the palace and delivers Tony Blair. And the Queen, in a shorter interview, invites him to form a government. And then, with all the security entourage, he drives back to Downing Street as the Prime Minister. John Major, after leaving the palace, asked to be driven to the Oval Cricket Ground. Because <laughs> is there nothing more important, even than being Prime Minister, than watching a game of cricket? So he drives off, has lunch at the Oval, and enjoys an afternoon of cricket. That same afternoon in Downing Street, one of the less known rituals takes place. And that is one of the most immediate obligations of the new Prime Minister is to be briefed by the Chief of the Defence Staff, in particular about Britain's nuclear deterrent. As we all know, but don't often think about, we have four Vanguard type submarines. Four of them, so there's always one in the ocean. One is being refitted and another is resting. And this dates back to the policy of mutual assured destruction from the Cold War, when these submarines were made mad mutually assured instruction. And each one of these submarines was built to deliver 
16 missiles, each of which ballistic missiles can split into eight separate targets. So there are 128 bombs that can land on a target. And each bomb is five times at least more powerful than the bombs we witnessed at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Now the ritual the Prime Minister has to do is our deterrence was devised on the principle that Britain is an island and very vulnerable to attack. And if there was an attack, all the forms of government, all the military installations would undoubtedly be destroyed, including Downing Street and including the Prime Minister, who would then be dead. So the Prime Minister has to write a letter giving instructions to the commanders of each of the four submarines saying what should be done if Britain had been destroyed. This letter is from a dead man. Yes. And they're written by hand. Each is put into an envelope, delivered to the submarine where it's put in a safe within a safe. They're never read. At the change of a prime minister, they're destroyed, unopened. They're not archived at the national records. So no one knows what is in these letters because in part it's part of our deterrence. But I always enjoy this ritual because there is the incoming Prime Minister. I imagine he was up till the early hours at Sedgefield, his constituency. Then he drove down or was driven down to London. To, to what was a glorious dawn on the South Bank. With a great party that we all enjoyed. And there he is, the first afternoon of power, sleepless with this decision that none of us will ever take except those few prime ministers. How do you instruct the commander? Do you say, fire your missiles, it is a deterrent? Do you say, surrender your submarine to a, a friendly power? Or what do you do? Do you destroy the world? Or do you do something different? Are you locked into a deterrent argument, which the chiefs of staff would persuade that that is the thing to do, otherwise the deterrent has no meaning. But let's leave um, Tony Blair alone <laughs> at this vast cabinet table with a pile of paper, a shredder, an ink pen and some envelopes. And let's go back to John Major, who's doing something more important. He's at the Oval, <laughs> a game of cricket, yeah. a cultural event. I think it was John Major who, after he left office, said the decision he most regretted was allowing schools to sell off their playing fields to raise money. Mm. He realized that these playing fields are where the imagination where it's nurtured. And I think once you are prime minister, you are locked into an institution. But outside that, you are an individual. And to give the base of our conversation a kernel, I think it is something that William Blake said, that's a little bit difficult to hold on to. But he made the comment that you mustn't see with the eye. You must see through the eye. That sounds quite a subtle distinction. But you find it in other places in, in literature. And I think what Blake was trying to suggest was that once you're in an institution, what you see is circumscribed and you're seeing with the eye. But wisdom comes through seeing through the eye, not being chained by the responsibilities and the framework of an institution. And he spent much of his life looking at how one can see through the eye and in particular how the imagination is important to dissent 
from the framework that is imposed upon us by the wonders of institutions. There are incredible things that can do powerful um, changes to our society, but you can also be locked into them. Yes. Freeing us of the constraints, seeing through the eye. When one of the things that just comes to my mind, Tim, but just to not at the risk of interrupting your flow, but um, I think it was E.F. Schumacher who said, everything can be seen directly except the eyes through which we see, which for me is talking about our potential for constraint, unconscious bias, holding on to certain frames, the notion in there of what came from Margaret Heffernan's work on willful blindness, our exploration of how we choose, these are her words, how we choose mostly consciously but mostly not to remain unseeing in situations where we could know and should know but don't know because it makes us feel better not to know. Mm. And I'm wondering if you're alluding to that, looking through the eye, free of constraint. Am I hearing you right, Tim? You are. Um, it's not a novel idea. Blake, though, pursued it. I was um, talking to a corporate anthropologist recently. Oh, right. And yeah. I guess I had to look up what a corporate anthropologist <laughs> did. And I went to a website where it began with a quote from Marcel Proust. And the quote was, the point of great voyages of discovery is not to see great vistas, but to return with new eyes. And I think that language yeah. is very common. Like G.K. Chesterton is often quoted that the point of traveling is not to see foreign lands, but to return and see your own land as if it were a foreign country. But we lose sight of that very quickly and very easily. And for Blake, to see through the eye is both a discipline and also an act of divinity. As a discipline, he approached it by saying the way to do this, the way to find a, a, a solution that dissents imaginatively from the constraints you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. So Tony Blair has this letter. He's got perhaps half an hour to make a decision whether to destroy the world as he's urged to by the chief of the defense staff to maintain our deterrence or find an alternative. It's impossible in that situation. It's only out of office that you can create other institutional solutions to it. But for Blake, what he tries to do is hold two countries in his mind together. Mostly we go for one or the other. For many imaginative creative people, by just colliding these two countries, you, you, you force yourself to escape that bipolar position and find another solution. And in doing that, he touches upon the imagination, which he thought was the true source of divinity. Again, this is not peculiar to William Blake. I was looking recently at Stanley Spencer, the 20th century artist, an eccentric man um, who had problems with marriage. But he once said... Usually around Cookham, isn't it? Around Cookham, yes. He lived almost his whole life in the village of Cookham on the River Thames. Mm. That was where he created his heaven, where he created his... Oh. Um, cosmology, cosmography. And he said, I think, what is the holiness of things except a thousand disparate 
celebrations of matrimony. And I think what he meant outside his problems with marriage was that you're trying to marry things together. Things which maybe no one thinks can be married or combined. And in that fusion or collision of two countries, perhaps something extraordinary can be created. One of the um, public solutions which struck me in my life as something unexpected and imaginative, goes back to the civil war in South Africa about apartheid. Mm. And at the end, when elections were held and a new majority government came in, they set up a commission for peace and reconciliation. And it was restorative justice, not retribution. It said, let's bring parties together to talk, the victim and the perpetrator, and let them talk. And to encourage that talk, we might even grant amnesty to some. And when I first came across that, I thought, what magnanimity that the incoming majority government had decided on a magnanimous solution rather than revert to mainly legal solutions where you have crime and punishment and retribution. Perhaps in the long term, it didn't work as well as others thought. I, I'm not greatly familiar with um, South Africa and what has happened since. But as a solution, it was surprising. Yes. It was a deep attempt to bring a civil war to an end and to let everyone move forward. An incredibly difficult thing to do. It was, it was a really galvanizing thing to do. And it strikes a chord for me as someone who goes to South Africa a lot. And I, <clears throat> without going into the details of the story, but back in 93, I was interviewing a number of ministers, new ministers in South Africa and government departments who had just come into power. And it was so striking that what they were led by, galvanized by, informed by, was about humanity, common ground, and not about vindictiveness. An extraordinary sense of being imbued by a leap of faith vision about creating something different and not to do with winning. And I was on a call recently on criminal justice in North America, where I was invited to close my eyes and think about, imagine a non-racist United States. And the facilitator, after 20 seconds, interrupted and said, what we find here is that many of us can't see anything when they're invited to do that, because we're not informed by a vision of that. So I'm really curious about how that ferments and how how say William Blake did that through both and his discipline, both and to divinity. He was such a hard worker, wasn't he? He was at it all the time, wasn't he? Writing. And what was what were his practices to him? If that was where you'd like to go next, to to he was a, a hard worker and he was committed to his life's endeavour. Yeah, there is a very curious issue in his notebook, his diary. And it says something like the 4th of March, 1807, <laughs> at four o'clock in the afternoon, despair. And people often read that and think Blake was depressed. But you have to read it the other way around with William Blake. It meant at one o'clock, Blake was back at his desk working again. He was an incredibly um, applied person who um, dealt with both images and text. And that is one of the fundamental domains where he brings two countries together. Did you ever look at his illuminated books? The image and the text are not illustrative of each other. 
okay. they are in opposition to each other mm. as blake would say opposition is true friendship bringing things together as contraries liberates the imagination makes it difficult he was an incredibly awkward person to deal with mm. but at the very essence contraries are important like in we all read and fonts and type there are two schools of thought often expressed in by designers of, of type and one is to make the font invisible to the content so you're looking straight through the type into the content and the other school is that the font should illustrate or magnify or oppose the process of reading it might frustrate you you have a gothic font which is almost impossible to read or you have helvetica which is everywhere yeah. and has become so ubiquitous that you look straight through it at the content so again the eye are you seeing with it or are you seeing something beyond it i remember as a child i suppose you all have this memory of learning to read and i was taught to read by my father one summer holiday <laughs> i was about four or something and um, we were on holiday by chance in Felpham, the village where William Blake lived oh. briefly. And every day he would take me down to the newsagent and we'd buy a broadsheet newspaper. And I have to say this, but my father was totally blind. He couldn't tell night from day. So I learned to read by being taught by someone who could not see or read. Well, there's a contrary, isn't it? <laughs> but he listened to the radio and he knew what would be on the front page age of a broadsheet broad newspaper and they had that wonderful quality they started out at the top with really large type headlines and gradually they get smaller and smaller we've rather lost this nowadays but by describing the shape of a letter and gradually going through the headlines and as we progressed over that summer holiday to the smaller type and content i was taught to read and it never left me that you're looking through what you cannot see, to see something that's more important. Looking through the eye to something that is more important, the discipline, the notion of contrarism, both and, to hold those and out of that comes something extraordinary, close to divinity. And Tim, as you think about 2020 and our world, what would you say to us about doing that more? I'm also curious about you and your dissenting imagination, how you look after that. What, what would you say to us about nurturing that, whatever the discipline might be? It's, for me, such a fundamental thing now about widening our, what are we missing? Widening our vistas, scales dropping from our eyes about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. How can we do more of that in your view? I think I would, pull back from the grand decisions because there are also lots of little decisions we take and in those small decisions we are exercising the imagination we are um, demonstrating the divinity in what we do so decisions needn't be enormous hmm. um, I think of um, at the Oval and yeah. cricket and I think we're both enthusiasts of cricket and there are I think three occasions when in international test match cricket a team has asked the other team to follow on and usually this is a successful strategy but only on three occasions in the whole history of test match cricket has a team ordered the other to follow on and lost it and each of them involved Australia. <laughs> once in 1894 in Sydney, and once in 1981 at Headingley, and once in 2001 in Calcutta. It's a small thing, but it's a decision that they fundamentally got wrong. 
And so on the cricket pitch, when you're doing something that's cultural, the consequences aren't like the one that Tony Blair had to consider, but they're nonetheless interesting about how you take a decision, whether it's small or large. And so I think in answer to your question, what would I be doing today? I would be very conscious of the large decisions that are outside my remit to take but the ones which are within my power to decide and to choose. And by being conscious of those everyday small decisions that I take through my actions or my inaction, especially through my inaction, which are so easy to overlook, what we choose not to do or choose not to think of even seeing. We require ourselves to see through the eye, not just with the eye. Cricket, culture, writing, art, that area of life is often dismissed as not being significant. But I, I think it is. And, you know, when you dip into the works and writings of artists, you often see a recognition of the self-importance or the importance of what they do. Like Paul Klee, the artist at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries, when photography was just making great inroads, he made the point that art does not represent the world. Art enables you to see the world. It's that looking through the eye, not just with the eye. Wonderful, Tim. You take us on such an arc looking through the eye. I'm tempted to come back to Tony Blair's letter. And I just wondered in the last minute or so whether, perhaps both of us, but I'd like to hazard what I would say. Um, but it'll be fanciful, but why not? Um, and I wondered what you would say. Um, you've, you've told me that a cat has adopted you through your window. Um, a wood pigeon has adopted me through my window. And I've been thinking about wood pigeons because I was listening to a nature program about, please look at your wood pigeon because they are things of real beauty. So I have, I haven't named this wood pigeon. He, he or she isn't here at the moment, but it is a lot. Lovely purple head and green comes out and one dismisses the wood pigeon. But anyway, I've been thinking about our cat and our wood pigeon, because I think imagination is about linking ideas in ways that might not seem possible. That's what the neuroscience tells us, I think, about imagination. So I'm thinking about your cat and my wood pigeon sitting out here quietly on the balcony here. And that's what gives rise to what I think I'd say in the letter, which, which is probably a bit fanciful, but why not? Which is come up and parley and find your enemy and just say it's over we're here you might get blown up i don't know but so that's where i went cat and the wood pigeon <laughs> did you want to hazard where you go or shall we pause that i think we'll pause it with tony blair having to take this momentous decision and i hope realizing that he hadn't perhaps given it enough thought beforehand because of the very structure of our institutional government. It's not something that is known enough to think about in office. It's something that has to come before you get to that point for all those small decisions we take every moment of each day. 
like Mandela did for 30 years before he took power. Exactly. Thinking aside. Thank you so much, Tim. We could talk all afternoon, but let's pause. Thank you so much. It's been great fun to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you.